Thank you. Uh, as a young uh, eight-year-old, I was in my parents' bedroom uh, when uh, Pearl Harbor was announced and followed the war for the next four years. And I was a hero of mine is President Dwight D. Eisenhower. On the same hand, as a young adult in 1960, I became a fan of John F. Kennedy. And we see the pictures of driving to the inauguration where they're as far apart in the limousine as they possibly can with a nice block between them. Was there true animosity between them or is it just because of the changing of guard to a Democratic president? Um, Eisenhower d had almost no respect for Kennedy. He just thought he was a, yo a young twerp who didn't know very much. But, and uh, so I wouldn't say there was animosity because Kennedy was very respectful of Eisenhower. He came to see him at the White House. Talk, and, and, but, but Eisenhower just simply just didn't, did, just didn't respect him. And Eisenhower did, did even though, he, did, even though he, wasn't a hu he, he wasn't in love with Nixon, he did want Nixon to win. He felt disappointed by the, by the result. He felt it, was, it reflected on him. It's a great scene. We know quite a bit about what happens when Kennedy comes to the White House to meet Eisenhower uh, after the, for the first time after the election. They have a couple of meetings, but the first time. And Kennedy is, is expecting to find an old, decrepit, kind of out of touch Eisenhower, a tired old man, the, the man that he had characterized in the campaign. Kennedy had said in the, on the campaign trail, seven lean years have withered the field of ideas. Uh, he was really critical about the, the lost years of the Eisenhower uh, era. Uh, the torch has to be passed to a new generation, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what did he find when he got into the White House? What did he find as he, as he leapt up the stairs, uh, shook Eisenhower's hand? Eisenhower took him back to the Oval Office and, and sat him down and said, essentially, listen, Sonny, this is a tough job, and here's how it works. And then he, without notes, without any briefing papers of any kind, he walked him through the entire, you know, responsibility of the, of the, of the presidency, the major issues of the day, the problem of the, of, of, that we were having at that time of, uh, of, of the gold standard, uh, national security issues. He walked him across the global map. And at the end of, the, end of that two-hour meeting, um, Kennedy leaves the White House and he gets back into the car and, and essentially turns to Bobby and said, Eisenhower was better than I thought. I, <laughs> I can see why he's president. <laughs> I mean, he, that's the thing about Ike. You, the closer you get to him, the more you see his extraordinary magnetism. And I think it, Kennedy came to realize it later. And after, as, as president, he did reach out to Eisenhower. Uh, his lowest moment was probably after the, the Bay of Pigs invasion. And, Eisenhower, and then he went to Camp David and, yeah. and saw Eisenhower when he was completely sort of beaten down. Eisenhower had very little sympathy for him, but because he thought he really thought he had bungled it, but he was, uh, but he, no, he, 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 Ike's advice and his, and his presence meant a lot to him right to the end. Well, know? and the, it also just reminds me of that my favorite of all the, uh, the Oval Office tapes, Kennedy o Oval Office tapes that I've ever heard, is the conversation that when Kennedy calls Eisenhower at the peak of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, and we now know, in hindsight, that uh, he's been meeting with the cabinet and his other advisors, and essentially they've all given him bad advice. I mean, all the way around the room, he's gotten terrible yeah, advice yeah. Uh, about what to do about the missile crisis, and he calls Eisenhower, and Eisenhower is really the only voice, that, if, at least from the way I would account it that day, is the only voice who really has a pretty accurate sense of what the stakes are here for the Soviets and what their reactions are likely to be, and it, and it seems seemed to be an influential moment. Just a reminder, this is what presidents have to do, have to make good decisions and big decisions, and you really better pray they're the right ones. Yeah. Well, it takes you back to the 1954, which we talked about in our discussion, where he's getting a lot of, he, Eisenhower himself is getting a lot of advice in, about uh, whether or not to intervene in Indochina, yeah. and much of that advice uh, is to pressure him to do something, to act. And he has to say, I don't think I'm going to do anything just yet. Let's see how it goes next week. And he keeps on delaying until fundamentally it's too late. Well, he's like, well, we'll consult with Congress, knowing there's no way Congress was ever going to approve it anyway, it's, mm. and, and so on and so on. Not yeah. unlike Obama no, exactly. and, uh, yeah. and oh, Libya, no. and, exactly. et cetera. Yeah. Exactly. I was really interested in your discussion of celebrity in the Eisenhower presidency, in the Eisenhower campaign. I think that's been a big part of the discussion of the 2016 campaign. It was really important to the 2008 campaign. Do you see Eisenhower not just as a unique celebrity campaigner, but as someone who changes the role of celebrity in politics? Sure. I mean, he's, he's the first TV, TV uh, campaigner and president. Um, it, it, he hated the fact that in 1952 he had to be turned into essentially a kind of a circus act, but he submitted to it. Um, 
It, the, there were still the sort of uh, whistle-stop tours, but there was a great deal of, of ballyhoo that went along with campaigning in 1952. Not in 1956, because he basically didn't, cam <laughs> didn't campaign. But in 52, it really was uh, a, 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 the beginnings of what we associate with a kind of the modern presidential campaign. And I think it, um, it, uh, it annoyed him, but he, he, he sucked it up. There were, you know, the, when, he, when, he, when he announces for president in Abilene in June, June um, he, they have they, they ship in elephants from Colorado uh, for the GOP symbol. They they, they have you know bunting and bands. Uh, it's televised and um, the heavens open. It rains just buckets the day the moment he gives his announcement speech. It's a disaster. He looks terrible. His, his glasses are slipping off his nose. His hair is all messed up. He's in a kind of a raincoat and it's all captured on TV. And the guys back in New York are watching this and they're like. Oh my goodness, this guy's a disaster. He doesn't know how to be a celebrity for the cameras. We have to fix that. And they spend a lot of time making him a more uh, appe appealing uh, public figure. He famously gets speaking advice from Robert Montgomery, an actor of the day, and, and turns himself into a figure for TV. But at the same time, he was awful. He was awful on TV. <laughs> well, was, I didn't say he no, was no, good, but no, it, it was the it first work. work. He was working at it. No, he was boring. He spoke in this horrible monotone. He, he, had, he, could, oh, he had zero connection. But he was still, what he had was being who he was. And that's the thing. He was the man who would, he's the man who had liberated Europe. He would lead the, led the Allied Expeditionary Force. He was a big man. Yeah. And that, that's what got him through, even though he would sit like this and read these, stu these, you know, these, read these speeches in, in these sort of these Midwestern monotone. But, so. but he also addressed the United States Congress in 1951 when he was head of NATO, uh, a joint session of the Congress to appeal for sending troops to Europe and to support NATO without notes. The guy had, 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 was pretty, pretty comfortable in his own skin. He knew how to speak to a big audience. Actually, I think, yes, and he, and he gave a great speech in London. I mean, yeah, I think the Guildhall speech. Guildhall speech yeah. and so on. He could, he could do it, but, but, but basically he didn't. He, he, the title of the book is Ike and Dick. Tell us about the relationship between the two of them during the presidency and how it changed. Well, that's, 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 that's the book. But um, <laughs> it, 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 basically, basically it began with these two people who barely knew each other. Ike had met him twice, but hard, couldn't remember him basically. And he, and he saw, Ike didn't much think, of polit think much of politicians and Nixon was a, was a first term senator who had, who had won the office with, a, with, a, with prop, one, of, one of the nastiest campaigns ever. And Eisenhower, and he was a lieutenant. <laughs> Eisenhower was a five-star general, and, uh, and 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 he and so he 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 was basically urged by his advisors to take him as vice president, even though he really didn't know him. But he was he, he had lots of things. He was a Californian, balance, geographical balance. He was a great red hunter. He'd been a uh, he had on the House Committee on Un-American Activities. He was the one who actually bagged somebody, Alger Hiss, and uh, and he. Uh, so he was uh, and, and he was and he was an internationalist. He supported the Marshall Plan. Well, that was very important to Eisenhower. So, but they didn't much like each other. They had very, and Eisenhower, you know, they, they did, in, today the vice president is in the, is in the White House, has an office. Eisenhower was over on Capitol Hill with his, with his, with, 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 with his only job, the only job of vice president is just to, is, is, is to be president of the Senate and to succeed if the, if the president dies. That's really the only thing he has to do. And, uh, but, th but that changed. Eisenhower began to have respect for him. He would send Nixon out on errands around the world. He was, uh, Nixon handled himself pretty well. Uh, and uh, and he um, and and so they, 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 things got better. Eisenhower wanted to get rid of him, as you mentioned, in 1956. He wanted him, and I still haven't figured out whether he really wanted him to get more more executive training, to be, for example, Secretary of Defense, which they offered him, or whether he just wanted him not, or, or whether he wanted somebody else in the line of succession. And I think it was co probably a combination of the two, possibly a little more wanting it, wanting someone else to be vice president. And then, uh, but then, it, and then it, it changed a lot. And then, and then toward the and toward, toward the end, I think he really wanted Nixon to win to win the White House by 1960. Even though he famously said that, that sort of give me a week, I can think of one when, when someone asked, has any has he contributed any 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 major ideas? But you have to remember, Eisenhower was having press conferences every week. So when he said give me a week and I'll think of one, he meant give me a week. He actually <laughs> it actually took a little longer before before he came back again. And then and then the post presidential it changed a lot. Then they became. They became a family. That was part of the story that intrigued me, that before before it was um, before it was all over, uh, his grand his grandson David, who he was very fond of, married Nixon's favorite daughter Julie. All oh, Nixon's I don't know that fair. Nixon's younger daughter Julie. <laughs> but uh, Nixon did allow. I mean, Eisenhower did allow Nixon to to, uh, to participate in the weekly very the much national so. security Nixon, meetings of the cabinet very meetings. Very much so. He was he was appalled yeah. that when Harry Truman became exactly. president, he wasn't even aware that we'd been developing an atomic bomb. Actually, Truman had met. After Truman was selected as vice president with Roosevelt, they met once for lunch. That was it. 
I mean, before the, before the election. Nothing about the bomb. No, no, nothing about the bomb, nothing, nothing. And Eisenhower really thought that was, out, that was outrageous. So, yes, he, exactly right. Truman was, he invited Nixon to chair, the, to, to chair the cabinet meetings, national security meetings when he wasn't there. He was, he was part of everything and was informed about everything. And, that, and, that was, and, uh, and, that, and that's absolutely, absolutely true. And then Kennedy promptly excludes uh, Vice President Johnson on um, the next administration. <laughs> that's right. Oh, so take another question. Well, because here. presidents live forever, we know that, yeah. Yeah, could you comment on uh, Eisenhower's final speech to the American people where he warned us of the potential dangers of the military industrial complex? Sure, I'd love to. What he actually said was, in order to, co to, to wage a Cold War, in order to gain our security, we have had to construct a military industrial complex. He didn't say, watch out, America. One day you might end up constructing it. He said, we've already done it. So he was acknowledging authorship, in a way, of building the military-industrial complex. Despite his instincts, he said, I wish I could make, have made government smaller and cheaper, but in fact, we've had to build these, these extraordinary resources um, to, 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 for, uh, to deter our enemies. I think the reason that he was sa saying that was because he, what, he, what he really wanted to say was, having built this damn thing, you better have a very, very good president running it, like me. And having elected Jack Kennedy, you're going to regret <laughs> that you got this little pipsqueak to run the military-industrial complex. So I guess, seriously, what he was saying was it's, a, it's the price of doing business in the modern world. We've ha we have this huge military, weapons that can destroy the planet many times over. We live in a dangerous world, so be aware of that. Be, understand the sinews of power. Understand where the levers of, of, of power and decision-making are. Uh, don't pretend that governing is easy. Uh, it, it is a cautionary. It's often used as a prophecy, but really he was describing where America was at at the moment. But did he, just to be clear, uh, and I don't know the answer to this, um, uh, you know, the way that I hear, in my ear, the way that that speech is most frequently described is him saying, beware yeah. the, the military-industrial complex. Did he say, we now have a military-industrial complex, and then say, and beware of it? Or is that not really part of what he was saying? Well, we just, there was a bit of warning in it, don't you? Don't you think? Yes, well, yeah. there, there is a bit of warning that, that, that this, is, this is only going to intensify as we move forward, and we have to guard against losing our freedom, yeah, losing yeah, our liberty, yeah. losing our financial what, yeah, security. And, yeah. yes, and that would course. not be a good thing, right? That would, that, and that would not be a good <laughs> yes, thing. But, but, but he, didn't, he didn't say that we shouldn't have a military-industrial complex. He said we've had to create it in order to, to secure our freedom. Having done so, we have to contain it. We have to make sure it doesn't overwhelm us. And that's a theme that actually runs throughout his presidency, is the need to build... Uh, vast nuclear weapon arsenal, but the, also the need to balance the budget and to be uh, very, very restrained on the spending side. I mean, Eisenhower did balance three of eight budgets, um, and the other ones he got pretty close. What an extraordinary achievement, considering what comes later. Three of eight. I mean, uh, Bill Clinton gets, uh, gets a couple, but other than that, nobody comes close to that record of fiscal stewardship. What, what, would, uh, what would Eisenhower say you know, in this vein of the military industrial complex? What would he say about, you know, again, you can't know, but channeling for him as best you could, Jeff. Um, I mean, what do you think he would say about this current, the current world we live in, both in terms of this incredible privatization of military uh, function, which is uh, a descendant of, of the world that he's describing, then, but also what he probably could not have imagined, uh, a, a kind of military complex in which a very small number of Americans are actually involved in it compared to his yeah, time, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that and the su that the sacrifice in a war like we had in Iraq yeah. is limited to a tiny I sliver. Love, that's a good. I would love to know what he would have said about the all volunteer army. I mean, I mean, he would. I mean, the question of not having a not having a draft and simply having, and, and simply having a privatized basically a, a, a private a private army in which anybody who doesn't want to serve can go and, and, and have and, and go their merry way. I think this. I really. I can't. I think this would have troubled him because he had a very strong sense of duty, and and that and I, th I thought he, he might have thought that no one people who didn't want to serve were shirking their duty in Europe. I mean, I, my wife is, is Danish in, in Denmark. Everybody everybody has to serve. What is it? 12, 14 months or something. Doing something, and we're and we're 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 free of it over here, and I think that would have bothered him a lot. But I don't I don't know. I, what do you think, Will? I think you're right about that. But but I, I do. I think that's just right. He he felt that uh, service of all kinds was an important uh, uh, important for citizens. The, the relationship between citizenship, the rights it, and the benefits of citizenship, and the obligations of service is something I think he just instinctively felt, as did many of his generation. Um, that said, I don't think Eisenhower would have been a man who said, well. It's better that we should lose many men in war than that we should lose few. 
I think just the opposite. He would say, the fewer we can lose in combat, the better. So if someone came along and said, President Eisenhower, we have just invented this extraordinary new thing called a drone, and we can drop it on a bad guy from uh, 15,000 feet, I think he would have said, bring it on. Oh, sure. I don't think he would have given it a second thought. He wouldn't have said, gee, well, that, that raises some moral issues for me. No, no, no way. No, no, no. He, he, no way. He, he, and, approved, he approved every advanced weapons. And, weapon and the use of covert operations, he was an enthusiast for because he had been during the Second World War. Right. Covert operations to, uh, to, 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 to kill the enemy was a very, uh, um, was considered a heroic service in the Second World War. And it was only natural that it bled on into the 1950s and the overthrowing of the Shah and the overthrowing of the Guatemalan government and so forth um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 53 and 54. Those were things that were consistent with his idea of how to use American power. Uh, if you could do it with a stiletto knife, so much the better. Yeah, yeah. but he probably could never have imagined, uh, though he would have applauded, but he could never have imagined that the commandos that he uh, was familiar with or the rangers he was familiar with in World War II uh, would have become what we have today, where a very small group of people can actually have the kind of tactical yeah. achievements that a regiment would have been required for far, far That's more. That's right, and he surely would have sent 750,000 troops to Iraq in March of 19, yeah. uh, 2003 rather than 150, because he was a Clausewitzian, right. which was if you're going to go to war, you go all in and you win everything right. and you go in big. And he would have, no he would, ambiguity. And he would have kept them there for and a And he would have kept them there. No, no yeah. doubt. No yes. problem. We bemoan the polarization of our political parties. You hinted, suggested, in fact, that things are going to end badly for these parties, not for the country. If we were to go back, we would have to recreate the kind of, the Democratic Party was two parties, Dixiecrats and Northern Union based, that sort of thing. I don't know if the Republican Party was, I'm most familiar with people like John Chafee, George Romney, um, Charles Percy of Illinois, those sorts of people were sort of a, these moderate to liberal Republicans. but. I don't think, I think the polarization is here to stay because now we're very clear on who they represent. We're not going back to the age of segregation and Dixiecrats. That ain't ever going to happen. So, got any ideas? <laughs> no, I, I mean, when I say it's going to, I just think this election, I, I, think, I think considering the, the cho his choice among candidates this year, I don't think this election is probably going to end very well, no matter how you put it. But, um, and I think the parties, the parties, unfortunately, I just think it's, I think it's a great pity that the parties no longer have room for these other voices, that the, that the George Romans, the Charles Percy's, the Jake Javis's and so on have no room in the Republican Party, and that the Strom Thurmond's and the, and the Dixiecrats, people like that, who would no longer be segregationists, not in today's world, have, have no place in, in the Democratic Party. They would, they, they, they would be conservative voices, and I think the, these, these people, the, uh, these, these people would, would, would have a place there that might, might actually be constructive, but we'll, yeah. we'll never know. The blue dog Democrats, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, who are now largely extinguished, yeah. yeah now uh, and they wouldn't, and they, it, would, it would no longer have been a segregationist right. wing. That would yeah. have been a, unacceptable. Right. That would have right. been, yeah. yeah. I've been around the, this Miller Center for a long time. I really enjoyed your discussion today and what you had to say about a number of things. As far as unity is concerned, which I think is extremely important to us today on all levels. We have uh, so many people who are mentally ill, who can't handle things well, and who are disrupting our society. I think what you talked about, the idea of having a, 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 a draft uh, for the service to the uh, United States would be a good way to vet that a little bit and find out who is in need of help from the standpoint of, of uh, of uh, the way they handle themselves individually. And I think we see all sorts of things happening every week in that respect, of the violence that occurs from these people who are somehow mentally off. Now, I think if we give everybody an opportunity to get into draft, that we'd have ability, ability for them to be under discipline and under a vetting procedure that would eliminate a large part of that. The other aspect of it is there's a gentleman over here uh, who spoke just a minute ago. Uh, he and I and Jerry Bilal's were the only white people who were attending a presentation by a, an historian at the uh, Monticello about seven or eight, six or seven years ago. And during this talk, there were black people there and there were white people, but there were only three white people. And the blacks in there mostly were with the NAACP. The historian who spoke, and I can't remember his name, uh, Mr. Hampson, do you remember the name of that speaker? And uh, uh, we were all impressed about what he had to say. And when he got through, the NAACP asked this black historian, 
why isn't, why aren't you out there backing up the programs that we have with the NAACP? You're an African American, you owe it to us. His response was rather interesting, and for me, it changed my life. He said, I'm not an African American, I am an American. And that was the most intelligent thing I've ever heard in relation to unity. Charlie, you, you would have served under uh, Ike, wouldn't you? When, you? when you were a soldier, wouldn't you? Well, I was a young infantry lieutenant, but then the, the uh, war ended, and I did serve under Ike in a more direct way, and that was uh, as the assistant curriculum chief of the Army's Information and Education Staff Service in Europe. Well, there we go. Well, on the topic of service, uh, right after the war, Eisenhower favored, uh, and so did the, 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 when he was chief of staff, the idea of universal military training. The idea that uh, there should be some carried off into, into po the post-war period, a, a, a way of ensuring uh, basic training for Americans in a time of uh, crisis and that it should continue. And it was too complicated, too costly, and uh, Americans were tired of the war and it didn't, it didn't get off the ground. But it's just an indication that, that those were ideas that were popular then. I think they've come back uh, from time to time in different places. People have talked about other ways for young people to, to do public service of some kind, and we have a number of programs. Um, Teach for America, AmeriCorps, the Peace Corps, et cetera. Um, and I think those are, those are valuable, but they, they, they are not required, <laughs> obviously. So. And people also have wondered if, if there were something like a draft today, there might be less inclination to get us involved in foreign wars since, the, uh, since we, 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 we couldn't just send those volunteers over there to get killed. Well, on, on Charlie's other question, which he's asked about before, this, um, uh, the, but th this usage of African American, uh, which is, uh, I think, could sound it, there still can be some debate around what exactly that means, I think. But it, it was interesting, one of you earlier uh, mentioned, yeah, you, when we, you were discussing the, the meeting of Dr. King with Eisenhower, uh, well, and the concern that, uh, him, no, I think it was yeah. you, um, uh, Will, saying that uh, you're part of his reaction, as, as yeah. indicated in the memos, is, well, but if I meet with these guys, th yeah. and of course, they would have been called Negroes then, yeah. not African Americans, but, oh, but then I'll have to meet with yeah. Li Lithuanian Americans and yeah. the, you know, the Italian Americans, the Greek Americans. It is interesting that, you know, actually, we've got this long history of that, of, of that much less ethnically identifiable groups, like, I mean, what does a Lithuanian American look like? I couldn't begin to tell you. I assume they're white, but, um, uh, but, the, uh, but actually, there is a long history of, uh, of, of those usages, I think. Because, I mean, by the way, that meeting with Ike was not a good meeting. They, they, everyone sort of spoke his piece, yeah. and I, you know, I was very polite, but it was all over. He, he talk, whoever he was talking to said, what's the problem? Basically, things are going well, we're trying to make progress, why should anyone be complaining? And that, so he was... Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Interestingly, I have one of my most treasured possessions. If anybody ever comes to my office, you'll see I'm a knick-knack guy. I've got all kinds of little objects all over the place. And this is not in my office. It's at my house. But one of my most treasured possessions is a recruiting poster from World War I, um, that, uh, a very particularly rare one, um, uh, but that was painted by this particular artist who painted uh, the, these posters that were millions of them were produced in all over the country. It's recruiting posters in World War I. And this one, it, it, ha it, it has liberty. Liberty, the, the sort of 1915 version of Lady Liberty, and she's holding a scroll that is unfolded out from her arm, uh, and the and on that scroll it says the honor roll of liberty or something like that, and then it has a series of names, and the names are very obviously ethnic all the way through. There's a oh, yeah. Polish names, Greek names, Italian names, uh, generic names that we would assume to be English, whatever. But there, gosh, there must be uh, 20 of them, 20 different names, all of which, and I suspect at that time would have been even more specifically identifiable to the public. But it's this list of very different names, including some that. That I think would suggest African Americans as well. Uh, the, the, that's a little harder to sort out. But then at the bottom, in big letters, it says "Americans all!" exclamation point. And so it's actually your point exactly, Charlie. But I thought it was a uh, uh, you know a one, wonderfully evocative image of the importance of recognizing both. <laughs> That you can, you, know, you, you can, your name can boy can be a Stoiko, you yeah, know, Dragovic, yeah. uh, but you're still, and you can call yourself a Serbian American, well, but it, you can also be an American. Ethnic politics in, on the, in the First World War were such that the country was so divided, and we were fighting in Europe against against uh, Germans, uh, that there was a lot of concern in the military and in the government about whether or not all Americans would rally to the cause of going to war in uh, in Europe, and indeed Woodrow Wilson said that the hyphen uh, between Lithuanian American or you know, Irish American was a dagger 
pointed to the national, uh, the national he, identity. Yeah, so he he had refu that concern. He refused, yeah. said, we will, not be considered, we will not consider ourselves uh, divided by ethnicity. We're all Americans. And uh, they made a big emphasis on just the, just the, uh, in just the ways you're describing, of showing that everyone is on the same role, you know, honor roll of liberty, despite your, the, your name. Could, could you imagine Eisenhower would be called a German-American fighting in a leading <laughs> league? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Eisenhower, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. I really enjoyed today's talk. Um, I have a question. In looking over the arc of Eisenhower's life, or especially his youth, what were a couple of pivotal events that had a ripple effect on the human being that he became and had an effect on the kind of president and his effectiveness um, as president? That's a great question. I should have asked it. <laughs> well, Stop. How do you want to start? Um, well, 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 I mean, there, there, there are two. I mean, there were personal things too. He never really recovered from the death of his first yeah. firstborn, for example. That was a huge, huge, huge trauma. And I think serving with Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines taught him how not to be how not to be a leader. <laughs> I think he once said, I, "I studied dramatics with MacArthur in the Philippines," and so on. And I think, but and then nothing. And then, but he he had never been in combat. I don't think he ever was in combat. But he but he became this. This leader, and I think leading, 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 leading the in Normandy, the D-Day, uh, that was that was the most form, that was the biggest thing he ever did, and, and much bigger than being president for him, actually. You're, uh, those are absolutely right. The loss of his son was a major blow in, in, in uh, er, er, January 1921, just right after Christmas 1920. Mm -hmm. uh, his son died of scarlet fever, and He's just destroyed him. Absolutely destroyed him before before old, his second yeah. son was yeah. born. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but of course, the big thing that changed his life was going to West Point, and he had no military. Uh, you know, he came from a family of uh, essentially, you know, Mennonites. Uh, they later became uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, they were deeply pacifist. They were uh, not totally nonconformist sort of country folk who read the Scripture every night and were profoundly religious. For him to go off to West Point for a military career was a major break with the the traditions of the family. And what's more, he never went back. <laughs> he, he did build his library and his museum in Abilene, but he didn't ever go back to Abilene to live. So I think, I think getting out of Kansas, getting out of Abilene via the military was something that he had no idea how it would propel him onto this future of fame and glory, but it, it certainly did. It was the biggest choice of his life, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thanks very much. Yes. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.